And now um, I'm really pleased to, to introduce uh, Michal Lemberger, who's going to be giving a Debar Torah today. Um, Michal is um, a brilliant teacher and author and a longtime member of our community. Um, and we are very pleased that you accepted our invitation to share your words of Torah today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Is that good? Everybody hear me? Okay. I want to tell you a story. Uh, some of you will will know this one. In the Talmud, in Tractate Baba Metzia, we read about a disagreement that gets so heated, the rabbis banish one of their own from the community. It starts off prosaically enough. The rabbis are confronted by a new piece of technology. In this case, it's an oven made of tile, layered with sand, and then the whole thing is encased to keep the heat in. As an aside, it sounds like a pretty effective oven to me, but that was not really the rabbi's concern. One of them, Rabbi Eliezer, thinks it over and gives his opinion. No problem, kosher, move on. Except they don't move on. All the other rabbis disagree with him. As I understand it, they think that it's the presence of the sand that could cause the oven to become impure, but again, that's not really the issue here. Rabbi Eliezer does his best to convince them, but they won't listen. This is where the story takes, well, a turn. In frustration, Rabbi Eliezer turns to the natural world for corroboration. First, he says, the carob tree will prove me right. And the carob tree gets up and walks away. No doubt looking for some peace and quiet somewhere without rabbis squabbling over an oven. The rabbis reject it. We don't take legal advice from a tree. So, he turns to the stream to prove his point. The stream runs backwards. The rabbis reject that too. Then Rabbi Eliezer brings things a bit closer to home. He calls upon the very walls of the Beit Midrash, the study hall, where they are sitting. The walls start to crumble, seemingly proving him right, until Rabbi Joshua steps in to reprimand the walls for butting in where they don't belong. Finally, Rabbi Eliezer is so worked up, keep in mind, this is all ostensibly about an oven, that he calls upon heaven itself. But even when a voice calls out from the heavens, telling the other rabbis to listen to him, they reject it. Lo bashamayim he, they say, it is not in heaven. What that means is that for them, halacha, or more broadly, Judaism, is a living set of beliefs that are open to change and interpretation. And that phrase, lo he, comes from today's Parsha. We're getting toward the end of the year and also the end of the cycle of reading the Torah on Shabbat mornings. We've seen the creation of the world, the descent into an exodus from Egypt and slavery, the giving of the Torah, the 40 years of wandering in the desert, and now, the people are camped on the other side of the river about to enter the land of Israel, the land that was promised to them so long before, and the Torah just stops. It stops to let Moses, who says, now I am 20 years old, which, you know, Kinahar, as my grandmother would have said, give a long speech to the people before handing over leadership and looking forward to his own death. That's what the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy, is. It's Moshe's repetition and amendment of what we've spent most of the year reading every week in synagogue, beginning with the Exodus, moving through laws, and taking them up to their present moment on the far side of the river, looking at the land of Israel. It all culminates in a list of blessings that God will bestow upon the people if they remain loyal to the law and to God, followed by a much longer list of curses, and I really want to emphasize how much longer that list of curses is, when they, that they will suffer when they don't. After all that, all the ways the people will be rewarded or punished by an external force, Moses ends by saying, lo bashamayim hi, velo me'ever layam. It is not in the heavens, and it is not beyond the sea. Ki karove lecha hadavar me'od beficha ubilvavecha la'asoto. It is very close. It is in your mouth, and it is in your heart. This has been a heartbreaking year. Full of shock, sorrow, anger, horror, division, 
and death. We've all felt it, but it started a little a little earlier for me. On September 27th of last year, just 10 days before October 7th, my sister died. I spent the last month of her life caring for her. Before she got sick, we lived very far away from each other. She was on the East Coast, I was here. And we, like many siblings, had a complicated relationship. She was also a person who guarded her privacy and dignity. So I really could not have predicted that in those final weeks, I would be interacting with her so intimately, not just with her as a person, but with her body and with her pain. What I wanted for her then was what we all want for those we love, to feel safe and cared for. And so I spent those weeks thinking about the small things that make up a day, what she wanted to eat, whether she would eat, whether she was clean and comfortable, whether she needed to be entertained or to rest. My sister didn't make it to even half of 120. And unlike Moses, she couldn't see the culmination of all she had worked for across a river. She also wouldn't have ended her life with a comprehensive summing up as Moses does. Where Moses is a grand, world-changing character, my sister was a master of the small gesture. She was more likely to leave crocheted baby booties, sewn talus bags, like mine, a carefully chosen gift. She didn't change the world in the way we usually mean it when we say that. She left it more beautiful, one small personal item at a time. Watching her navigate an increasingly dire illness and then being with her as she accepted the inevitability of her death made me see something in this week's Parsha I never paid attention to before. Moses lived a public life and he had a public death. At the very end of his life, Moses climbs Mount Nebo and God shows him the land beyond the river, the place to which he worked so hard to drag his recalcitrant, fractious people but which he won't get to experience himself. This is immediately followed by the phrase, Moses died there. And then God buries his body somewhere we never see. So when I say he had a public death, I'm not talking about those last minutes. I mean we have now read an entire book of the Torah that constitutes his parting words, but at no point does he share a single moment with his wife or children. They have disappeared from the story. Moses was a man of the people. He belonged to the people. As we all know, Moses' great tragedy is that he doesn't make it into the promised land. But there is another tragedy here. We know that he had a family, a wife, children, siblings. He wasn't just a leader, he was also part of a community. But the Torah doesn't give us that side of him. His story is incomplete. He is not given a private existence. The story as we have it erases those personal connections. It's in that private existence where the rest of us live. It's where my sister lived, and it's where she died. This past year, in which even for me, my, sister, my sister's death got bound up and sometimes overshadowed by the public deaths we have all witnessed, I've been reminded that there is private grief behind even the most public of bereavement. For every death we think of as ours, collectively, there is a family, a lover, a friend, who will carry their sorrow for the individual they have lost for the rest of their lives. Yeah. I fear that in our own fractious times, we sometimes overlook that. We are living through a moment that demands that we pay attention to larger world-sweeping events. In the face of those events, we feel strongly. And sometimes those feelings become so strong that they drive us to strip things down, to ignore complexity and drive wedges between those who should, or maybe just could, be friends and ally allies. So I think it's worth remembering what began, what sparked that argument in Baba Metzia, the one that ends with Rabbi Eliezer ostracized by his community. It wasn't earth-shaking. The rabbis don't get all worked up over an esoteric or deep philosophical con 
concept, they got to a place of irreparable breakage over something as small, as ordinary, and ultimately as necessary as an oven. Because we need ovens. They provide sustenance and heat. They keep us alive. But if an oven catches fire, it can burn the whole house down. Those small things, like arguments over ovens, they matter. They can shatter a community into warring factions that not even the heavens can bring back together. But the small things can also bring people together. They can offer hope in a hopeless moment, giving soup to a dying family member, prattling nonsense to distract her, driving someone over ho to a hospital over a bloody border. Those gestures matter. Because if you add up enough of them, they can become an antidote to the temptation to paint with such a broad brushstroke that a way forward becomes impossible to imagine, much less enact. My sister was never interested in the esoteric or philosophical. We didn't talk about her outlook on her life or her legacy. We didn't even discuss how she felt about the reality of her impending death. For four years, she subjected herself to every treatment chase every medical option so that she could continue to live, no matter the side effects or how difficult the recovery was. It was the act of living that mattered to her. Here's what we did do in those final weeks. We watched a lot of cooking shows. She was an amazing cook. She taught me how to crochet. She welcomed every friend and colleague who came, who came to visit her. We focused on the small and intensely private experience of her dying on the small gestures that got us through every extra day we got to spend together. Even in my grief, I hold on to the hope that they comforted her. I am not saying that we should put aside the big, important ideas and arguments we must make to ensure a just and peaceful future. Those are necessary, but they aren't everything. Because life, comfort, connection, change, it is not in heaven, and it is not across the sea. Loba shamayinki. It is in our hands, and it is in our hearts. Shabbat shalom.